All right, we're going to talk about the scene sequel cycle. I know that could be a mouthful, but the purpose of this is to actually help you with the writing of your stories. I mean, we, we've talked about the 12 stages of the hero's journey, which is sort of the big overall story. We've talked about the eight archetypes. So those are the various job positions that need to be filled within your story. But eventually, we can talk and theorize all day, but eventually it gets down to the actual narration, the actual telling of the story. And even there, there have been um, some successful formulas to help us tell a good story. And this is coming from many, many years experience, um, not from myself, but from the people who came up with the scene sequel cycle in analyzing story. And you know, some, you know, if you read enough books, you're going to find that there are certain patterns. And once you've identified those patterns, if you can apply them to your own writing, that's going to give you an advantage. That's going to give you the experience of um, writers way, way beyond your years. So you, uh, as a young writer, you're gaining the experience of many writers who are much older than you. So one of those patterns we call the scene sequel cycle. And it seems a little complicated. I'm going to try to walk you through it as best as I can. The scene sequel cycle came from this guy named Dwight Swain. And he wrote a book called Techniques of the Selling Writer. And it's a very popular book, a very good book. If, you are ser if anyone's serious about writing, it's a must read. It's going to really help you to pinpoint those areas that might make your story less successful. But think about this. It's not just telling a good story, but a story that's so good People are willing to pay to read it. Now that kind of story needs to be exceptional because all these people and their busy lives, why are they going to set aside the time to read your story, let alone pay $30 for a hardcover book uh, version or $13 for an ebook? $13, that could pay, that's a whole month of Netflix. Why would they drop that for one book? Well, people do. And I go to, uh, when I drive by Barnes & Noble, that parking lot's packed. And I'm like, wow, I guess people really want to read. Or maybe they just want coffee. Not sure. But it looks like there's a market for people who are reading. In any event, whether you're very serious or you want to get published or not, the real point of this is you can learn from these techniques and accelerate your writing. So, the scene sequel cycle has two parts. The first is the scene that takes place. The scene is a very specific, you know, it has a very specific setting, and there's very specific actions that are going to take place there. So, I can write a screenplay for a film, which is our hero's journey. Then I could pay for uh, all the people who are going to be in my movie, that's your archetypes. But eventually, we got to get the cameras, put them on a tripod, plug them in, and start filming. Okay? And when we do that, that's called the scene. Where exactly are, am I going to put all the equipment? Where are the lights going to go? What is this light going to focus on? What is camera four going to focus on? What's camera one going to look at? See what I mean? A scene is very specific it's it's when the guy and the girl are on a dinner date they're sitting at the restaurant that is the scene the part where maybe she's finding a dress for that dinner well, that's a whole different scene that's a whole different location so scene is extremely specific now after we do the scene then we have something called the sequel which is the thing that happens after the scene. Makes sense, right? Okay. So, after we do the sequel, we repeat this process again. So it looks something like this, where we write a scene, then we write a sequel to that scene, then we do another scene, and then a sequel to that scene, 
And then again and again, scene, sequel, scene, sequel. And we can do this from the beginning all the way to the end of our story. Now, each of these blocks has its own little mini stages that need to take place. So let's examine just the scene. Those are the yellow blocks here. Let's look closely at that. A scene has three parts to it. First is the hero's goal. Now, it doesn't have to be the hero. It could be whoever your character in that scene is, whoever the main character is. I don't care if it's at a party and you got 20 people, you still can only focus on one person, okay? Otherwise, you're not writing. You're now reporting information, and that's what we don't want. To get to the level of true writing, we pick someone that we're going to focus on. Even if it's third person, you still need to focus on one person's perspective of that scene. Okay, if it's a party, yeah, there's 100 people in the room, but we're focused on one person. Now, if you want to look at that party from another perspective, guess what? That's a whole other scene, okay? It's a whole different chapter. So, let's focus on one person. So, what's the hero's goal? Now, this isn't the goal that we find in the hero's journey. No, 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 no. This is much smaller. We're not, the goal isn't to overthrow the bad guy and save the world. No, no, no. Way too big. We got to think real small. Like, what can happen in the next three to five minutes? That's their goal. So in this case, the goal is to eat this ice cream. They wanted to go to Rite Aid and get an ice cream. The goal is to eat the ice cream. Got it? Pretty simple, right? It's not to save the world. It's just to get an ice cream. It can happen in about three to five minutes. Now, the second part is what we call the conflict. So something is going to get in the way. Because a hero without conflict is boring. Okay? If, if we let the hero want the ice cream and then get the ice cream and eat it, we have no story to tell. All we, we have a news article is what we have. So, conflict. Something's going to get in the way. And then, do not let your hero reach their goal. Because if you let them reach their goal right here, you've lost your readers. Boring. Your re your, remember, your hero must be the one who's always taking action. It's their actions that change their world. They're not waiting for something to happen to them. No, no, no. That doesn't drive story. What drives stories is the characters constantly doing something. So, the character wants the ice cream. Conflict. And then, disaster. The ice cream falls on the floor. So what happened to their goal? It's, all over, it's gone, isn't it? We've totally destroyed their goal. So because their goal has been ruined, we now go to the sequel. We must now feel the reaction of what has happened to that scene. The character must now react. We have to feel their pain. We've got to stop telling the story and allow the reader to experience all the emotion that's happening because of the disaster. The ice cream fell on the floor. The heroes looking down at their feet, just feeling totally at a loss here. They wanted that ice cream so bad. And then there's a dilemma. A choice needs to be made. A dilemma happens when there are no good choices. That's the definition of a dilemma. When all options are bad. So, the hero can either eat the ice cream anyway. Hey, 10 second rule, right? They can walk away, but then somebody might accuse them of littering or something. I don't know. They could try to clean it up, but what if you're out in front of Rite Aid? How are you going to clean it up? I mean, you got to understand, if you eat it, you look like you're homeless. <laughs> if you walk away, you look like a schmuck who doesn't care about 
your community. And if you go to clean it up, then you look like a janitor. So there's really no good choices here. So then your character must make a decision. That's the third stage. They decide to take the riskiest one. But it's got to be plausible. I mean, we got to give our heroes some... It's got to be a decision that you think can work. But it's risky. So of the three options, what do you guys think might be the riskiest one? Eat to eat it? Okay. So now, guess what? The hero has a new goal, which is to eat the ice cream without anybody noticing. So what happens now? We go right back through the whole thing again. Their goal is to eat the ice cream without someone noticing. Then there'll be a conflict. And guess what? Someone is staring right at them. Disaster. Their goal has failed. They now react to that. Oh my gosh, I can't believe someone saw me. We experienced the pain. Now what? They have a new choice, and they make a new decision, and then we have a new goal, and we do it all over again. And we can go for a novel from beginning to end doing this exact cycle and write compelling stories. Why? For lots of reasons. Number one, your character is the one who's doing all the actions, which is what it needs to be. They can't wait for things to happen to them. They're the ones changing. Why? Because they have goals and they're making decisions. Okay, now, does everyone feel like they get that? Okay, I'm going to go through a little detail on each one with an example story. Now, this is not to say, uh, this is, you know, sentence one, uh, sentence two. No, 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 no. We're not writing essays. Okay, so remember you guys uh, did that stuff, you know, uh, for example, you know, um, as a result, remember that stuff? Okay, that is not what we're doing. We're going to have blocks of sentences that cover each area. So let's take a look at this sample story about our friend Billy Banks. And Billy Banks has been picked on by Bones McFadden for years. And finally, Billy Banks has been taking some kickboxing lessons, and he's ready to ambush Bones. He's not strong enough to fight him face to face, but he can probably drop kick him in the back of the neck. So the goal in this scene is for Billy Banks to ambush Bones McFadden in the hallway. This is a high school. Billy Banks was finally ready to take on Bones McFadden once and for all. He burst into the polished hallway and made a straight path towards his locker. Billy felt extra confident that Bones' back was turned. Billy clenched his fist and readied his attack, and then conflict. Bones turned around suddenly and faced Billy with a steely grin. Billy's heart skipped a beat, and he almost tripped over his beat-up Nikes. He recovered in an awkward microsecond, then clenched his fists with determination. Now disaster. Then... Like a ghostly apparition, Sally materialized in front of Billy. He almost walked right into her, but he knew better than to get any closer than kissing distance. Not yet, anyway. So, you going to the dance? She sang. Billy thought, I better not confront Bones now, especially that Sally's here. So what's happened to his goal? We totally destroyed it. Now, if he goes on to have a conversation with Sally, that's the wrong move because our story is going to get way off track. We can't forget. His goal is to ambush Bones, right? So he still needs to go after that goal. It's like he's got a one-track mind. So we now go into his reaction. He can't fight him. Everything's ruined. And he answers her question. She says, so you go into the dance? Sh sure, said Billy. Great, Bone's little heavy metal goons came stampeding down the stairs to back him up. Billy let out a frustrated sigh, ah, slumped his shoulders, and turned his attention back to Sally. You okay? she asked. You look distracted. Okay, now he has a decision to make. Dilemma. Um, the dance? You going? 
she asked him. Um, Billy glanced at the watch, at his watch. There were three minutes before the bell rings. Could he knock out Bones in less than three minutes? Isn't that one round in boxing? Bones turned his back again. All right, do you see how Billy Banks has a one-track mind? Do you see that? You see why he didn't engage in a conversation with Sally? Because that wasn't his goal. It would be different if it was, right? His goal was to get Sally's attention. Okay, that's different. His goal, he wanted to hit this guy. And just because she's there, she ruined everything. He has an impossible choice to make. What is his choice? Either ignore her and go cause a violent scene to happen, or he can lose his only opportunity and talk to Sally. Yeah, maybe get a date, but you know, Bones will probably bully him from now on the rest of the year. So, what does he do? And that is what keeps your readers reading your stories. He makes a risky decision, but it could work. So what do you think he would do? Of the two decisions, which one takes the most risk? Talking to Sally? Or hitting him in, going after him? Yeah, going after him is going to be riskier. So guess what? That's where my story is going to go. And this is an example of how good character drives your plot. Billy switched to violence mode. He took a deep breath and took a step past Sally. I'll be right back, Billy said as he brushed past her shoulder and headed straight towards either total victory or total teenage annihilation. Okay, really cheesy story. But it does develop the point where we see him reacting and doing different things, right? Okay, so what's his new goal now? At first it was to ambush him. Now it's to actually fight and win. New goal. New conflict needs to happen. Then a disaster is going to happen. Man, why, someone's going to get in the way, right? So you might say, will Billy ever get to ever fight him? Well, you could, because when he gets faced with the next dilemma, he could actually at that point fight. Because remember, time is moving forward. So eventually your character could make that decision to fight regardless of the disaster. Okay. So now, does everyone feel like they got that? Okay. Now we're going to get into an even smaller unit of measure. Think of that as like uh, feet. Now we're going to go into the inches that make up that. Okay. Remember I said how it's, um, each of the stages is not just one sentence, but a bunch of sentences? Now we're going to look at what each sentence is representing. Okay? So, goal, conflict, disaster, reaction, dilemma, decision. Do you guys get that pattern down pretty good? Let's look at each thing now. So, a goal has four parts. A conflict has four parts. A disaster has four parts. Luckily, they're all the same, so we don't have a whole lot to memorize here. So, we're going to talk about something called the Motivation <laughs> Reaction Unit, the MRU. Okay. I know it's a big word to try to understand, but what it's talking about is that we're going to do like this. The first sentence will always be about character motivation which is external. The other three sentences are all reaction. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like. Remember, motivation is external and objective. It's what the camera is looking at. So I want you guys to think about measures of time. And that's how we organize it. So the first sentence, or the first sort of reaction, is what you feel. And you got to think, how long does it take to feel something? Almost no time, right? Can you even measure it? It's practically immeasurable, right? It's instant, right? Feelings, okay? But then, what's the unit of measure for reflex? Maybe half a second or one second? All right, so if you feel scared all of a sudden because a spider just jumped on your desk, First, you feel scared. 
But then your body does a physiological reaction, which is to maybe jump. But then when you want to smash the spider, that takes more thought, right? That takes longer. You have to actually think about what you're going to do. That's what we call rational action and speech. You might actually make an exclamation. Oh, what the? Okay. So you get, you, you understand the order. First you feel, then you react, and then you do or say something. Okay. So let's go and look through the story and notice how all these pieces start to come together. So first, what does the camera see? Well, we see Bones standing at his locker. That's external. Now we're going to go internal. Because he sees him standing at the locker, what does he feel when he sees that? He feels confident, right? He feels confident. So then, what is his physiological reaction to that confidence? He clenches his teeth. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then he actually does something. He gets ready. When I say readied his attack, it could be more descriptive. Like he pulls out his brass knuckles or something, right? Okay, so now that was the um, setup. That's the goal. Now, conflict. We go through the process again. What does the camera see? Well, Bones turns around. And now we're looking at Bones. Do you see how that's external? That's outside of Billy's head. It's, it's like what a camera is looking at. We see Bones standing in front of us now. Well, now that Bones turned around, how does Billy feel about that? His heart skips a beat. So what is that feeling? Scared. He's scared. But did I say Billy felt scared? That's weak, right? You always want to show, not tell. What does scared look like? Well, his heart skips a beat. And then, yeah, what's his physiological reaction? What's he do? He trips over his shoes. He couldn't help it. He couldn't think about that. It just happened. But now he has time to think. And now he recovers and he's ready to go after bones. The next stage is the disaster. And we start again. What does the camera see? Well, Sally shows up. How does he feel when Sally shows up? He almost walks right into her. What is that feeling? Like he didn't even notice, right? So, but then he does notice, and what is what's his physiological reaction? What's he do? He stops, right? He stops. He just stops walking. But then what does he rationally do? He thinks about what's going on. Do you see how we go through this process? Okay. So that right there shows you how we just repeat that same sequence. So now what does he see? And then how does he feel about that? And what does he do or say? And then, okay, now that he did that, what does he see now? And then what does he feel? And then what does he do? Then, because he did that, what does he see? And now how does he feel? And what does he do? See, if you follow that process, you get the whole novel. And you've accomplished everything that great writers try to accomplish. Great internal like conflict, as well as external. And the story is constantly moving. So everything you've learned about good writing is tied up into this formula. So to practice that, tomorrow we're actually going to do a worksheet in class that you guys will practice this. And most students say, after practicing and getting it, they're like, I wish you taught me this, you know, months ago, last semester. You know, it would have helped a ton. Well, um, let's take a look. So first thing I want to do, and this template is going to be on the course website. So you can download it. And if you fill it out for yourself, if you're having trouble with your story, just fill out this form and keep doing it until you get to 10 pages. There you go. You'll have a pretty good story. So the first thing I want to do before I start getting into the MRUs is I want to identify my scene sequel cycle. So 
Goal. In the beginning of this scene, my character wants to. So give me a character. Um, let's pick on, who are we going to pick on in here? We'll pick on Jimmy. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll pick on um, Trevor. Sounds good. Trevor wants to do what? What's he want to do? Give me a goal. He needs a goal. Something he can only do in three to five minutes. <laughs> it could, no, it could be, if you want to say get a girlfriend, that's fine, but we have to break it down into smaller. Okay, Trevor wants to ask, we need a name like um, Sandra out to prom. Okay, so he wants to ask her out to prom, and or what? Where are we? We're like at uh, lunchtime. Yeah. Lunchtime in the quad. Oh, let's do passing period. You know why I like passing period? Because there's a time lock. Okay, passing period before six. This means this is the last possible chance he has. If he doesn't do it now, it's over. All right, that's his goal. He wants to ask her out. But something's going to stop him. Oh, no, now it gets complicated. So her name, let's use good old Sally. Sally's got this way of just appearing. Yeah. <laughs> Sally appears out of nowhere. <laughs> That's another good one. Like some guy starts talking to her. Oh, so he's a... Oh! So some guy <laughs> comes up to talk to her. You know, you know when the guy is nervous... There's nothing worse than other people, like, talking to her. It's like, everybody go away, you know? <laughs> and now this guy comes up to talk to her. And so now what r happens to his goal? We have to totally destroy it. That's when he kisses her, right? The guy kisses her on the cheek. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry. The guy kisses her on the cheek because, you know, we'll keep it appropriate. All right, now we have to feel the pain. So how is our character going to react to this? It's got to be real quick, though. Does he have time to cry? He falls on the floor and screams in the sky. I think crying, I, he might cry later, but I think it's too... He won't just, like, see the guy kissing her. <laughs> no, it doesn't quite. <laughs> we need to slow down. What's he going to feel? Oh, throws the flowers. Oh, I like he throws the flowers on the ground. Oh, drops. Okay, he drops them, like, okay. Now he has a dilemma. He has to choose between two bad choices, which is what? He can either sort of give up, right? Which means he definitely will never reach his goal. Or... Go anyway or fight, push the big guy? Tell the big guy, hey, I'm taking, confront. confront the other guy all right so after careful thought the character decides to take great risk and confront the guy so now what is trevor's new goal his new goal is to drive the guy we didn't say fight or anything we just want him to go away all right, now, in, so, as you can see, the goal started with him wanting to ask her out. Then a lot of stuff happened, and so now he's got to do this thing. 
But then the question that students always ask, if we keep throwing disasters at him, at what point does he ever get to ask her? Well, he's going to have to go through a lot, isn't he? He will eventually be able to. If Now, that's where the hero's journey comes in. Because the hero's journey helps us to know where this thing has got to go. Cause, and that's where we have characters like the mentor who can step in and help get things back on track, right? Or allies or someone to that effect. This is why we need them. Because without them, as you can see, a story truly driven by character decision can just go out way out of control. So we have to have some kind of guide of where it's going. We as the writer know if he ever will ask her. We know that answer. But to get him there, it's going to take a lot of work. And that's exactly what good stories are about. OK, so let's go up at the top now. So what you're going to do is fill out that scene sequel like we just did. You see that? Now we have to break it down into smaller pieces. So on the part where he wants to ask her out to prom, what is the camera looking at? What do we see? OK, so we see the girl. Now, this is, these are not the sentences I would actually use in my story. You understand that, right? This is all notes. Once I have this form filled out, I can then just write my story freely. But at least I have a good idea of things. So we see the girl standing by herself at her locker. I know. The hero is walking out from, oh, walking to the restroom. <laughs> okay. Now, when he sees her standing by himself, what is herself, sorry, when he sees her standing by herself, what does he feel? This is the initial feeling. What's his feeling? He feels nervous. And so what does that look like? Because we can't tell the reader he feels. We can't use the word nervous. His palms start sweating. His face turns red. He cracks his knuckles. These are all different things that might happen. Now. Now that he felt nervous, what is his reaction to these nervous feelings? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Socks himself in the stomach. All right. I'm going to put in parentheses self motivation. <gasps> That's what that means. Okay, but she, hopefully she doesn't see any of this. It's all <laughs> happening very quickly. All right, now what is he? Now that he's got time to think, he sees her, and what's he thinking, or what does he do at this point? Okay, so he can think about what he can say or how he can ask her about how he can ask her to prom. So do you see where this takes more than one sentence to do that? It might take a paragraph. Where he just stands there and goes, okay, this is my only chance. I have to ask her. You know, I only got six minutes left. This is where you talk about all of that. Okay, now that he's th thought about what he's going to do, and we've established the goal, we now go to the conflict. So we know that some guy is going to come up to talk to her. So we know... So that some guy's going to talk to her. So what does he see? No, no, hold on. He doesn't feel it yet. What does the camera see? He sees a tough guy to come up and, yeah, whisper in her ear. In her ear. This is from a distance, right? And now the guy doesn't kiss her yet, right? He just, he just comes up to her. 
So he that's what he sees. When he sees that, what does he instantly feel? What's the word of how he feels? Anger. So anger equals, because I can't use the word anger, how do I show it? What's, what's he do to show he's angry? He doesn't drop the flowers yet, does he? Is that further down? That's after the, he sees the kiss. <laughs> the vein pop. What does anger look like? Well, first we want to talk about physio physiological. Clenched teeth. His, his, what happens to your... What happens to your... Yeah, eyebrows tense up. This is where observing people and knowing physiology helps you, right? Okay, and then, so what is, how does he react to this anger? He feels it like, uh, and then what does he do about the anger? What's he do about it? No, he doesn't have time to do push-ups. Oh, okay. Okay, so the adrenaline pumps in, right? So he starts breathing. He's like, <sighs> takes a deep breath, right? He's going to do this. He has a goal. He's got to ask her. He uh, uh, takes a deep breath. And then what does he think about or say or do? He, he can do, now he can do something rational. He walks towards her. But walk is, instead of walking, strides. It picks up a jog. I don't know. Strides. That's like, you feeling it? It's like, no, I'm determined to ask her and right when he's about to get closer what do we see the guy kisses her let's just do the lips for like 10 seconds <laughs> oh my gosh what did the character what does he feel now embarrassed and what does that look like Face turns red. The world turns to slow motion. Well, this is very surreal now, right? Anyway, hey, hey, before you guys leave, do you guys understand the pattern now? All right. I, do you feel like this helps you with your stories? That's how you move your story, right? And you know what? Do you think this takes away from creativity? Not at all. It adds more Yeah, it helps you come up with great tense situations that keeps your reader reading. And that's what you want, right? That's the book. Okay. Yeah, that's from that book about how to write for money. <laughs>